do a few minutes here just to allow a few more people to join. Um, and here we are. How is everybody doing? <laughs> All right, so just a couple more minutes here. We'll wait, how about one minute for a few more people to join. This will be um, recorded and sent out to um, everyone who's a potential applicant. So keep that in mind. We have a few panelists with us here today who we'll introduce soon. Um, but this is the Teach Abroad in Spain webinar. We're hearing from current and former participants. Right. I'm going to go ahead and unmute our panelists, who are Alvin, John, and Margaret. And Hillary is here with me as well. Apparently, I have to unmute them, so <laughs> hold on just a second. We'd previously been using a different platform for our webinars, so here we go. There we are. Everyone can hear me and say hi, I am hoping. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. Hi. You're on your phone, John. Is your phone working with the Zoom platform? Um, no. So actually, I did get my computer back. Everything seems to be okay <laughs> for now. So okay. fingers crossed. <laughs> Excellent. Well, what good timing. Thank you both yeah. for joining us. Of course. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as I said, this is being recorded. It will be sent out to everyone. We're going to start by um, just a general overview. What is CIEE? We're going to talk about the Teach in Spain programs, the different options that we have, and give an overview of the auxiliar position, the language and culture assistant position. We'll meet our current and former participants. So we have Margaret, who is a short-term participant um, here in the office with us. She's our program assistant at the moment. Um, and then we have Alvin and John, who are currently on program. We will hear about all their experiences on different topics and have a Q&A at the end um, with them. So CIEE is a nonprofit, non-governmental organization. It's been about 73 years now. If we've been around since 1947, um, we're the world leader in international education and exchange, and we have helped thousands of people gain the knowledge and skills to live in a, in a globally interdependent and culturally diverse world by offering these comprehensive, relevant, and valuable exchange programs. Um, so we offer a lot of different programs, teach abroad, which we'll talk about today, of course, study abroad programs for college students, high school and gap year programs, work in professional exchanges, and more. Um, we're quite a small team. We're based in Portland, Maine. We also, there's an office in, in Boston, Massachusetts, but Portland is the headquarters office um, right in the downtown area of Portland. Um, the core team is made up of Stephen, who is our director, Hillary and myself, the Spain team, Luke, our manager. Um, he also manages a few programs of his own. And Carrie, we're, we have one open position currently, so we're looking for, for another team member. Um, but right now it's Stephen, Hillary, myself, Luke, and Carrie. Um, so a little bit about me, I obviously am here in the U.S. in the Portland office. My experience in Spain included a semester at Universidad de Salamanca studying Spanish language and literature and translation and another semester in Zaragoza um, where I worked in a language academy. So it wasn't a public school or, um, like this position. I was teaching learners from age three to adult, um, but Spain, as we all 
hear from our, our applicants and participants that kind of captured my, my attention, my, my heart. Um, but I started out really early in eighth grade in high school with a couple of exchange programs. Um, one particularly that set me off in Spanish was the Dominican Republic. That really changed my worldview. Um, and I've worked with CIEE since 2016 currently with the teacher Brad team, but previously I was working with participant services on the support team um, where I did high level support for participants on our program. So it could be any program anywhere in the world, um, which has greatly informed my work on the teacher Brad team as well. And I can answer questions about enrollment, visa process, preparing to go to Spain and just general program questions. Hi guys, uh, my name is Hillary and I'm the other Teaching Spain coordinator with Miranda. <clears throat> um, I've also had a lot of experience in Spain and with CIEE. My first um, introduction, introduction to CIEE was when I studied abroad in college um, and I went to Sevilla for 10 months, lived with a host family and um, that really was an experience that boosted my language skills and uh, made me much more independent and just super excited to be in Spain and I wanted to go back as soon as possible. Um, so I came back to the States in between to graduate um, and worked for a bit and then I found the TEACH program through CIE and went back to Spain to teach in Madrid with this program for two years. Um, and I stayed in the same school for both those years so I really um, got close connections with the teachers I worked with and also with the students and this past summer I got to go back for orientation mm -hmm. um, as a coordinator and I visited my school again um, after two years and it was it was really fun to have that reunion. Um, so CIE again has been a big part of my life especially now that I work for them um, so now I'm on the other side of the program um, helping others um, get the same experience that I did um, and I just highly encourage anyone to go teach abroad if they have any sort of desire um, to do so because um, it really is life-changing and very rewarding. Um, so like Miranda, you can always reach out to me about um, the enrollment process, joining the program, applications, um, the visa process, which will happen mostly later this spring, um, preparing to go to Spain, any cultural differences, you know, what it's like to live there, um, and then just general program questions about um, whether it's Spain or other um, <laughs> country pro, uh, programs that we offer. Um, and my info is at the bottom if you want to reach out. Thank you, Hillary. Um, so do you want to tell everyone about a bit about eligibility for this program and then we'll talk about the role itself? Yes, so to apply to our programs, um, you have to have the following requirements. Um, you must be either a native English speaker or have native English fluency. Um, you need to be a citizen of the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, or Ireland. You must have a bachelor's degree before you travel. Um, this can be in any subject. It does not have to be in education, um, but if it is, that's obviously um, a great thing and that gives you a boost, but um, we will not decline an application based on what <laughs> field your bachelor's degree is in. If you are graduating this spring and don't have a bachelor's degree yet, um, that's totally fine. You can get an, a note from your registrar's office um, stating your intended graduation date and that will fulfill the requirement for the application for now. And then once you get your diploma, you can upload that later. Um, no formal teaching experience is required, but obviously that's great if you already have some. Um, you're gonna be a language assistant, which we'll get into in a second. Um, but you're not going to be the lead teacher, which is why um, it's not required specifically for this program. Um, the only language profic proficiency required is for our basics program. Um, and we'll talk about that as well in a second, but it has a shorter orientation and um, a smaller window of time in between orientation and when you start teaching. So finding housing and adjusting to Spain is going to be a little more rushed with this program. So we do ask that participants um, have a stronger language proficiency and have lived abroad before. Okay, so Spain is our biggest program um, out of the whole teach abroad department. And we have a number of options for the academic year. 
Um, our biggest one is Teach in Spain. It's just labeled as this on our website. Um, you'll teach for 10 months in Madrid. Um, all of these programs are based in the region of Madrid. Um, so you'll get a placement within the region. You'll have orientation in September, um, and you'll start teaching in October. The Spain Basics, as I said a second ago, um, this is geared towards participants who have lived abroad before, they have teaching experience, and they have um, a strong proficiency in Spanish. Um, you can talk to us about your experience if you think you'd be eligible for this program, but you can also read more on our website about what we require. Um, the two immersion programs we offer are uh, based are based in Madrid, sorry. Um, so these two start in August, so it's a bit earlier. Um, with both of these programs, you're gonna be living with a host family in the capital for either two weeks or four weeks, um, based on which one you choose. And you're also gonna be taking three hours of Spanish classes a day at a language academy, and you'll have a placement test um, to make sure you're in the right class, but it's all conversation-based. So these two programs are great if you really just wanna dive into the language and culture of Spain before you start teaching. Um, with all of these four, Spain, Spain Basics, Immersion two weeks and Immersion four weeks, you're all gonna be starting at your placement school in early October, but your orientation date will vary. So again, Immersion will start in August, Teach in Spain will start in September, and then Teach in Spain Basics will start at the end of September. Um, and you can add a TEFL certification to any of these programs. Again, you're going to be a language assistant with these programs, so TEFL is optional. Um, unlike some of our other Teach Abroad programs, it's required based on um, which partner they're working with, but for Spain, um, it's a great add-on if you're looking to possibly teach abroad in the future. Um, if you'd like to work with ESL students in the States, um, it never expires. So if that's something you want to look into, just let any of us know and we'll be happy to give you some more details. Thanks, Hilary. So a little bit about the job, um, and we'll hear more about it from our panelists. It's a 16-hour week, um, you, so you have four days a week, so typically Monday through Thursday or Tuesday through Friday. This is decided with your school. It's not something that CIEE decides for you or with the school. It's something you work out directly with them. Everyone gets paid a thousand euro monthly stipend. Um, the government of Madrid, we partner with to place everyone in, the, in their schools. They pay this. CIE doesn't pay participants. So the thousand euros comes from Comunidad de Madrid um, and placements are all around the region. Um, so there are a few, about a third of them are in the city area, which is made of 21 different districts, very large city, um, and two thirds of them are going to be outside and surrounding suburbs and smaller towns. Usually the average commute time for someone who's, who's commuting out of the city is going to be about an hour. Um, but the way that the Comunidad de Madrid looks at this job is kind of like a paid internship. So that's the thousand euro stipend everybody gets. Um, if you work less than expected, you might have, so might be less if, you, if you're not working the 16 hours. If you work more, they should compensate you accordingly. Um, you have paid time off. So holidays in Spain, you're not expected to work. Obviously, if your school is not in session, you are also able to have that time off. All right. So a little bit about your role as a language and culture assistant. Um, again, you're going to be working a part-time schedule and you're there to really inspire the students to get excited about learning English. Um, you will be expected to speak in English at all times, even if you do know some Spanish. Um, you're really trying to get the kids to be comfortable with you as a foreigner um, and just um, get them excited. You're not gonna be in charge of lesson planning or grading any student work, so you can really focus on um, the students uh, English abilities and um, helping them if they're struggling. Um, your teachers will tell you what they expect you to do in the classroom. Some teachers are very open and 
welcoming and we'll let you, you know, take over a lesson, but other teachers um, will have you work more one-on-one -on -one with students. It really depends on your school and, and who you're working with. Um, so some of these roles are cultural presentations. Um, you can create games or supplemental activities. Um, again, the conversation skills is a huge part of your job. When I was there as a participant, um, with the third grade, I would take every student out individually into the hallway and we would um, just go over a list of questions, but develop it into a conversation. And little by little throughout the year, they'd become more and more comfortable with speaking with me and um, their fluency um, advanced a lot, which was really fun to see. Um, and going off of that, they were studying for an English exam at the end of the year. And so um, that one-on-one -on -one time really helped them um, other language assistants have said they uh, work with small groups. Um, they kind of float around the classroom and help kids with um, their workbooks. Um, you're, you're there to really just be ready to do anything um, that your teacher asks of you. And it's pretty fun. The kids um, love having somebody new in the classroom. Um, they love asking questions and learning more about you. And you'll be working in multiple subject areas as well, which keeps the role um, fresh and interesting. Um, so some of these subjects include history, science, art, um, or PE. Um, generally, classes that are not taught in English include math, ethics, and music. Um, so you'll get a variety um, in your daily schedule and also in your weekly schedule, which is fun. So I'd love to introduce our panel participants. So first up, we have Alvin. Alvin, I have a bit about you here, but why don't you introduce yourself, please? <laughs> All right. Uh, my name's Alvin. I graduated from the University of Washington this past year in biology. So it's definitely not related to my degree <laughs> at all. So it's fine if you don't have a degree in education. I'm still enjoying my time here a lot. Awesome. Uh, Everything's going well so far. I know I, I was actually at Alvin's orientation in October, so he was part of our later arrival this October, um, but everything's going well, Alvin? Yes. Awesome. Uh, after, after finding an apartment and settling <laughs> in, getting into the group of things, everything is amazing here. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. And John, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, so uh, my name is John, and I am from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, that's also where I graduated from. I studied communications, and I also minored in English and Spanish. So I think it was a ended up being a pretty good combination for uh, for doing this job. Um, I love a lot of things, but the main <laughs> things I probably enjoy the most would be music. Um, I love playing guitar. Um, also enjoy studying languages, mainly Spanish right now. Uh, um, also really enjoy uh, playing a good board game, me and my friends back home. Uh, me and my friends back home in Memphis, that was something we always did uh, a lot together was play board games together. And so that's how we would bond and everything. And then, of course, I also love a great cup of coffee. <laughs> Thankfully, there is no shortage of that in Madrid. Nope, um, you're in a good place for that, for sure. Yes, I am. Absolutely. And uh I, as you can see, I'm uh, teaching right now in uh, IES Barrio Loranca in Fuenlabrada, which is in the south. Um, and I also live near there, uh, about actually just 20 minutes away in Getafe. So. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us, and I'm glad your computer's back in working order. Um, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And our last panelist here is actually sitting right beside me. Her name is Margaret Brush. Margaret, you want to introduce yourself to everyone? Hi, like Miranda said, my name is Margaret Brush, um, and I was a participant in the short-term program this past year in 2019. Um, I'm from Key, New Hampshire, and I graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a Bachelor's of Arts in Spanish and Linguistics. Additionally, I was TEFL certified before I went abroad. Um, I had a little bit of a different experience. I taught at two different schools, and they were vocational programs, so I worked with adults. And after um, moving back to the States from Spain, I moved to Portland, Maine, and now I'm working with CIE to help people teach abroad in Spain. Awesome. Thanks, Margaret. 
Um, so these are topics for, for today. We're going to be touching on teaching, commuting, going to the doctor while in Spain, housing, private tutoring, and saving. So we're going to ask a few of the panelists. We're going to go in order um, to weigh in on each of the topics, and you can hear their thoughts on, on all of the above here. So our first topic is teaching. Um, so I'm going to have Alvin go first, um, but generally we um, want to know a general overview of your experience, the subjects you've helped with, primary versus secondary, what age group you are working with, the prep time dress code, how many different teachers you're collaborating with, um, etc. So Alvin, why don't you tell us first what your experience has been? Yeah, so the general overview is that I come in at nine teaching mm -hmm. at a primary school and my day ends at four, but as the other slide shows, you only work 16 hours. So within my normal day, I have about two and a half hours worth of break, which I do for planning trips on the weekend or at this time of the month, it's getting ready for Carnival. So I'm just cutting <laughs> things for different teachers. Um, the subjects that I teach are all of them. So I do natural science, social science, art. Uh, and Are you in a bilingual school, Alvin, or a non-bilingual school? I'm in a bilingual school. Awesome. Yeah. And then, so like I said, I teach primary school. And with that, I don't have any prep time. Um, there are just times where I help out the teachers during my first hour of break because break is two hours for my school for the auxiliary artists. And so that could be utilized for helping teachers or working on personal things. The dress code is fairly lax. They don't expect you to dress professionally. So I've worn everything I brought with me in my suitcase and I haven't gotten <laughs> golden for it or I haven't been told to wear something more professional. But my school, there hasn't been any much issue with dress codes. Awesome. Teachers who I worked with during the first semester, I worked with second through sixth grade, so that's about five teachers. But because of my school's rules that we had to switch schedules with other auxiliaries, I switched with an auxiliar who has only two grades. So instead of second through six, I'm now five or fifth and sixth graders. So I'm only working with two teachers now. Okay. And then in terms of grades, so now, currently, <laughs> fifth and sixth grade, and the age group. Uh, Self-explanatory. So if we don't have U.S. people, if the, anyone on the attendees list is not from the U.S., fifth and sixth graders are usually 11 and 12 years old, I believe, um, yep. or 12, 13, I think 11 and 12. Um, but John, what, are, what is your experience teaching so far this year? Yeah, so... Um... As a general overview, I, I, I am teaching in a secondary school. Um, that's the school that I preferred. So like when I applied, I signed up specifically for a secondary school. Um, I teach mainly English. Um, I'm actually also involved uh, a little bit in the social sciences in the history department, um, but like with a specific project. Mm -hmm. um, it's a specific project called Global Classrooms. Um, it's a, it's a model UN program. It's Ooh. really, really cool. Um, that is cool. Yeah. So yeah. And then also, I'm also doing some, uh, Cambridge oral exam prep with the students of those history classes. Mm -hmm. Um, but as far as like actual teaching, I've only like actually taught English classes, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. And um, bilingual or non-bilingual school? It is bilingual. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and then so as far as prep time goes, for me personally, I think I have a bit more prep time than the general auxiliary. Uh, I think basically like my school operates a little bit differently. So they give the auxiliaries a lot more freedom and a lot more independence. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like plan lessons that they want to teach and like to give content that they want to. Um, and so I spend maybe about an hour and a half uh, maybe roughly an hour and a half each day um, coming up with what I want to plan uh, for my lessons across the week. So 
but that's just my personal experience. Um, mm-hmm. Every school is different. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's what I've come to find is every school is like, can be vastly different. So yeah. basically just expect to fall in line with what your school wants you to do. Um, and yeah, just, just go with the flow and uh, just do your best uh, to work with them um, in that way. Um, as far as dress code goes, uh, totally the same experience as Alpin's had. <laughs> um, it's definitely very accepting. It's very casual. Personally, I like to dress like just, uh, I don't know, I guess I could just call it snappy casual. Um, <laughs> I, always, I always wear a button down and either jeans or khakis. Um, but I did also know other auxiliaries who wear like shorts and a t-shirt and it was never an issue. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so you can do that what you will. Personally, I just like to wear the generally the same thing each day. Um, teachers I work with, I work with four different teachers. Um, two from the history department, as I said, and then two from the English department. Um, they're all really great. They're all super, super nice. Um, and I really haven't had any problems with them at all. Um, as far as grades and age groups, I actually... It's a pretty wide range. Um, I teach all the way from uh, first ESO all the way up to uh, second bachillerato. So basically that means I'm teaching like 11 and 12 year olds all the way up to like 18 through 20 year olds. So I I come up with a wide variety of activities and uh, lessons throughout the week. So Awesome. Thank you. That's very, very diverse experience indeed. And yes, Margaret also, Margaret also has a quite a um, experience to share being placed at two different schools. Um, that is possible. It's not the most common arrangement. Most people are only at one school, but Margaret happened to be one of the lucky ones. That got two. <laughs> um, yeah, so I worked at two schools. Both of them were in Mosulis. Um, my longest commute was about an hour and then the other one was about 35 minutes on a good day. Um, they were students who were at least 16 years old, but then they ranged to like 50. There were definitely some, um, older adults in my classes. And that's uh, not very common at all. My, I think Margaret's the only person I've actually spoken <laughs> to that had that experience particularly. Yes. Um, it, it was like students who were studying vocational, um, secondary studies, but weren't going to university. So... The classes, um, and they, these weren't bilingual schools, um, so I taught strictly English classes, but within the context of different studies. So I taught some, like, marketing classes in English. Um, I had an app development class. Um, there was, like, an administrative assistant course. So it was pretty varied um, and pretty interesting. Um, it was really easy to kind of create a lot of cultural activities to go with these classes. Um, in both of my schools, the teachers had had like a very established uh, relationship with auxiliars. Like they, they had one every year. So I came in um, not having to do much prep because a lot of it was prepared for me. Um, as far as dress code, it was pretty casual. Um, for the most part, I just wore jeans and a sweater or a blouse and that was fine. Uh, I worked with two different teachers at one school. And then at my other school, I worked with one teacher, um, but I did work with about probably six or eight different classes. So awesome. Well, thank you, Margaret, Alvin, and John. Next topic is commuting, and I think for time's sake, and we just heard about Margaret's commute um, in a nutshell, um, for time's sake, we're going to do just John and Alvin for this one, but we're wondering how long is your commute, how much does it cost, what do you take, so train bus metro, and how did you figure out your route to work every day? John, you want to go first? Sure. Um, So my commute is actually pretty nice. Um, Like I said, Um, I live in Getafe, which is very close to Fuenlabrada, and so I take the metro, and it's about like 12 metro stops away, so it takes me about 20 minutes, Um, maybe 30, maybe 25 or 30 with uh, walking as well, so that's quite nice. Um, As far as how far I am from the the city center, though, that's kind of the trade-off, so I take the train, uh, the Cercanias, to get to the city center and that takes me usually somewhere between um, like 30 to 45 minutes. So uh, just kind of give you an idea of what to expect there. 
Um, if you're close to your school, you'll probably be further away from the city center and vice versa. So you just mm -hmm. kind of have to decide like what your priority is in that regard. Um, how much it costs? Uh, I guess you guys have probably already heard this. It's um, I was on the Abona Hoban, which is 20, <laughs> 20 a month. Did you age out of it? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, so I was on the Abona Hoban, which is 20 euros a month. Unfortunately, it's a great deal. <laughs> it is a wonderful deal. Absolutely incredible, especially considering that since I am all the way out in the E2 zone, it's mm -hmm. jumped from 20 euros a month to 72. Wow. So happy birthday to me. That's, <laughs> that's what I'm paying for now. <laughs> yep. Happy birthday to you indeed. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, but yeah, so that is uh, the, a change to expect if you're going to be turning 26 while you're here. Um, but like I said, uh, I just take metro and train. Um, I looked at bus routes. Unfortunately, none of them really seemed to work well with my location. Um, if I were to use bus, it would take me an hour and a half to get where I'm going. So I just forgot about that idea. But mm -hmm. I do know other auxiliaries who actually like exclusively use the bus system. So that's really great. It just depends all on um, what you, uh, where you are. So, mm -hmm. um, and as far as figuring out routes and transportation, um, I have two specific apps that, uh, I don't know, maybe the um, listeners have already heard about, but uh, specifically one of them is just called, um, it's just the Metro Madrid app. So it's really great. It can basically, you can put in your location, like a Metro stop, and then the Metro stop where you're going or the train station where you're going, it will plan your route for you. It'll give you an estimated time. Um, and also there's another app called City Mapper. Uh, that does the same thing, okay? So, but City Mapper actually will do it for any city, not just Madrid. So, if you are going to a city that has a metro that's not Madrid, you can just put it in, and it will help you uh, get around. So, it's super helpful. It works for trains, for metros, whatever. Um, so, highly recommend City Mapper. That's how I uh, usually get around and plan my routes. So, great. Thanks, John. How about you, Alvin? Yeah, I've also heard of City Mapper. I haven't used it personally, personally, but <laughs> most of my friends have used it, and it's very, very accurate. I use Google Maps and Move It, M O O P I T, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's pretty accurate as well. And it works for all for cities all around the world with metro systems. My commute is a little under an hour, so not as great as John's, but it's <laughs> still manageable, and that's one way. Uh, awesome. I, I use that time to just nap or <laughs> plan trips for later holidays. Um, similar to John, my I'm not on the Holden card, so but instead of John's 79, I'm 89 because I'm further out from the city center. So that's, that's steep. How much it costs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I take a combination of the bus and the metro. So I live in the very center in Seoul. And luckily, there's the line three that connects me to my station that takes me from there to my school by bus. So it's a very easy route. Awesome. Great. Thank you all. Um, the next topic is going to the doctor while in Spain. Um, so all I, I didn't, I wasn't, sh I wasn't sure, Alvin, if you had had to go to the doctor yet, since you, it's been, it's been a couple months now. But um, I have Hillary here, and Margaret, and I wanted to ask John first if you've been to the doctor um, in Madrid or in Spain yet. What your experience was, where you went, did you have to miss? any days of school, if you needed a justificante, um, an excuse note, um, and how much did it cost? John, have you, have you had to go to the doctor while you've been in Spain or no? Um, so unfortunately, yes, um. I actually have quite an experience with um, <laughs> going to the doctor. Um, Do tell. So, yeah, so actually, um, just uh, I think it was like three weeks ago, I actually got the flu oh, while no. I was here. And by far, that was the absolute worst experience I have had here, yeah. really, just in the past, like, year. Like, it was <laughs> super terrible. Um, I think it was going around, like, a lot of people got it. Um, mm -hmm. But I did 
end up going to a doctor and it was actually a really great experience. I went to a private medical center uh, here in the Hitafe, just a five minute walk from my house actually. Um, my roommate showed me where it was. So got there super quick and it was really great service actually. Um, they were super nice and it was, I wanna say it was around 8.30 in the evening going on nine, but they still saw me, they were still open. Wow. Um, I don't know if all centers are like that. Like I said, it was a private medical center. Um, I don't recall the name at the moment, um, but nonetheless, uh, they saw me quickly. Um, the woman that saw me actually did speak English, which surprised me because what you'll find is the further you out you get from the city center, the fewer people speak mm -hmm. any English. Mm -hmm. um, so that was wonderful. That was really helpful um, for just kind of getting over some of those uh, tough translations. Um, as far as missing school, absolutely, yes. <laughs> I missed school for like almost a whole week. Um, oh. Yeah, unfortunately. But my super, my professors were super understanding and super cool. So uh, nothing nothing went wrong. Everything was very smooth. Um, I did need a uh, justificante, but it was not a very strict thing. Um, my bilingual coordinator said that if, if I didn't even technically need an actual justificante, just any kind of like proof that I was at the doctor, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. a out of like a receipt of a prescription or something mm -hmm. like that. She said anything like that would work. Um, unfortunately, I obtained a justificante without problem. Um, so that was a very easy process. Um, as far as how much it costs, um, I actually have a international insurance. So I do have iNext as well, mm -hmm. but my primary insurance I use is uh, Cigna Global. Um, oh, wow. it's got really, yeah, it's got really, really great coverage. Um, and so it did that particular visit did not cost me anything. So I was Excellent. very thankful for that. And yeah. they gave me a prescription and uh, sent me on my way. So you're feeling better now. <laughs> oh yes, feeling great now. Good. Um, before that, sorry, I'm, I'm taking a little too much time. No, it's um, okay. Before that, I actually went to the emergency room. Oh, wow. <laughs> before that, because that's how terrible I felt. Would not recommend going to the, to the emergency room. Um, me and my, my roommates, they were there with me. We ended up leaving because it just, like, we were there for two hours without being seen. So oh. that was my personal experience. It might be different for you guys. I don't know. I personally would not recommend it. Um, the serve, yeah, Unless the service there true was like, emergency, like a right, you know, right. have no choice, <laughs> right? Exactly, yeah. So, would not recommend doing that. So, what about you, Margaret? I know that you just told me that you've had to, you had to go while you were there. What, ha what was the deal with, with your doctor's visit? I actually got sick like literally two days after I arrived in Madrid, which was oh. not fun. I think I missed the first two days of school, but um. Luckily, the in-country staff were super awesome and helped me out right away. Um, I forget exactly which hospital I went to, but it was right in the center. And the best thing was that um, I just made my appointment over WhatsApp, and they spoke English perfectly. Doctor spoke English, and everything was fine. Um, it was kind of expensive. I want to say it was like 120 euros, but um, I got reimbursed, so... Through I next. Yes. Through the CIE insurance is called I next. Um, and you do usually have to pay up front, but if you keep your receipts, you can um, get reimbursed as long as it's not an exclusion, which we can talk about in more depth in a different webinar. <laughs> but for the time's sake, we're going to move on to the next topic. Thank you both. Um, so housing, which is everyone's favorite topic. Um, we want to know and inquiring minds want to know cost of rent, what neighborhoods and towns you live in, um, how you found your housing, which websites you use, how long did it take, how many roommates do you have, and if your apartment was furnished or unfurnished. Um, so Alvin, I know you live in Seoul, which is the very center of the city, must be, must be interesting. Can you go first and tell us about your apartment? Yeah, so I'm only a few minutes away from a lot of metro stops and a lot of lines that connects to it. So that makes going to different places around the city very useful. Um, the cost of my room, we split it among, I, I split it among two others. So there's three of, of us total. And it comes to about 480 after um, the room and the bills, the utilities. That's awesome. And 
yeah, so it's not that bad when it comes to living in Seoul. And um, so living in Seoul, it's very nice. It's close to a lot of uh, a lot of grocery stores, a lot of places to go out, and there's so many things to do in the very center. Um, what in terms of the websites I use, I use Idealista and Photocasa, and it took me probably two and a half to three weeks after arriving from or for, for orientation to find a place. What did you do in the interim? Did you stay in a hotel or a hostel while you looked for your apartment? I stayed in an Airbnb in the meantime oh. because there were a few of us who didn't have accommodations or who didn't have permanent housing mm -hmm. at the time. So it was a good idea for all of us to be staying in an Airbnb together. It was cheaper or fairly the same as a hostel would be. Awesome. And yeah, was it so furnished? Luckily, it came furnished. Awesome. So I was happy with that. <laughs> Great. How about you, Margaret? Um, so I also lived in Seoul, right in the center. My rent, I believe, so when I first moved into the apartment, which was um, a five-bedroom apartment, I had an interior room, which I'm sure some people will, will encounter. Yes, it has no windows. Um, but luckily, I was able to move out to another uh, room in the same apartment within a month. Um, but my rent was three fifty at the beginning, and then at the end, I was paying about four twenty five with utilities included, which is pretty good, and I would say slightly cheaper than average um, for living in Seoul. Um, to find it, I used Idealista, and it only took me about two weeks. Uh, it was a furnished apartment. And then while or after orientation and before I moved in, I stayed in an Airbnb also with some people I had connected with via Facebook before going to Madrid. Did you have four roommates if it was a five or yes. four or five bedroom apartment, you said? Yes. Yes. Awesome. And John, what's your experience with housing and finding it? <laughs> yeah, so for me, um, the cost of my rent, um, it's a little less than uh, Alvin and Margaret. I pay uh, 400 even per month nice. uh, for my um, room out here in Getafe. Um, and like I've already said, I, I do live in Getafe. I, I did look around at a lot of other places. Like I was looking more in the near the center at first, like places around Seoul, maybe Atocha, um, Lava Pia, some of the more popular neighborhoods. Um, Unfortunately, like I kind of had a little bit of trouble, um, just kind of like different things weren't working out very well. Some landlords weren't getting back to me. So um, for me, it took me the better part of a month, I'd say. Um, the websites I used, uh, I kind of went back and forth between three, which were Idealista, um, an app called Badi, and then a, another website called uh, Spotahome. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, it ended up being the one that worked out for me. So personally, I would definitely recommend Idealista as the best one. Um, at first, I liked it the least, and then <laughs> once I actually, yeah, well, once I actually like learned how to use it, take advantage of it, it ended up being the best one because it gives you the big, the widest range of rooms available. Um, and was your apartment? Is it was it furnished when you moved in? Yes, it was, thankfully. Um, it was furnished and it's got pretty much everything you could need. Um, and then it was really awesome because uh, uh, we kind of have an agreement with our landlord that any other small things that we buy and furnish for the apartment, uh, she takes that out of our rent for the month. Oh, so, wow. for example, I bought a coffee maker for the apartment and then she deducted that from our rent. So it was oh, quite nice. Um, very cool. Yeah, and so I, I live with uh, two other guys. So there's just three of us. They are students um, at the uh, university down here. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it's a good place to live. We get along great. And yeah, so that's my experience. Excellent. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so another topic that we hear a lot about um, is private tutoring. And this is a side income type situation for auxiliares. Um, in high demand, so English speakers teaching private les lessons or tutoring their students or students, um, you know, maybe not at their school, maybe they 
you know, find them in a different way. But I want Hillary, Margaret, and John for this one. Um, so Hillary, could you go first and tell us about your tutoring experience? How many students you had? How did you find you, these opportunities? How much did you charge, et cetera? Yeah, so um, I knew pretty much off the bat that I wanted to be a private tutor on the side um, just because I wanted something else to do with my afternoons. My school ran from nine to two, so I had um, a substantial amount of time to fill up. And I also just wanted to keep myself busy um, and also save more money so that I could go on trips. Um, one of my goals while I was there was to do as much traveling in my free time as possible and private tutoring really helped with that and it also helped me develop a closer relationship with some of my students and also developed my teaching skills. Um, so every week I had four lessons. Um, I had a, uh, two uh, students that I tutored from my school but then I also taught two classes um, at a private language academy and I fell into that uh, opportunity through Facebook actually um, <laughs> there was an American living in the town that I was placed in for my school um, and we got to talking before I even went to Spain and she ran the academy and um, so I taught a group of second graders and then I also taught um, a conversation class for high school uh, students at another school down the street um, so between all four of those, um, I earned about 60 extra euros a week. Um, I charged 15 an hour. So, and it was the same with the private language academy. It was 15 an hour. Um, and yeah, so the, the private tutoring opportunities I found directly through the parents, which is how most language assistants will find opportunities. Um, there were three other assistants at my school, and all four of us were approached by parents within like the first two weeks. <laughs> so it is something to think about when you get there, because parents know that language assistants are helping at the school, and they do want um, you know, native English speakers to help their students or their children with homework and conversation skills. So, um, you know, I would kind of be ready with an answer um, early on because um, all of us fell into that situation and it was great. We didn't have to, you know, advertise ourselves really. Um, but if that doesn't happen to you, you know, you can uh, reach out to your bilingual coordinator or the teachers that you work with and have them make an announcement to the parents and just uh, notify them that you're available for after school hours um, to help with homework and things like that. Um, with the private language academy opportunities, I walked to those. Um, again, they were in the same area as my school and then for private tutoring the parents would just pick us all up from school the students and myself <laughs> and then we'd all drive together um, to their house to their homes and then um, from one of the students houses I would walk to the bus stop afterwards and, and go back into the city that way and then another um, parent uh, of the other family would drive me to the bus stop because it was a little farther um, so that was really convenient and I also didn't want to charge more um, because, you know, it's just helping with homework and they gave me rides and they were very friendly and um, yeah, so that worked out really well. Um, the ages, again, I taught the second grade class. Um, I taught one second grader and a third grader. They were sisters and then I taught another third grader, but I also had helped him in my first year teaching when he was in second grade, so I um, stayed with him and for preparation, um, I would prep after school sometimes, um, but most of it I would do just at my apartment at the end of the day, um, and at the end of the week I would just kind of consider what worked well for that week and what I could do better the next week, and I got other ideas through blogs and Pinterest and Teachers Pay Teachers, and um, also based on the homework that they had. I tried to make it a bit more fun um, with games and um, activities and stuff, so. And how about you, John? Do you do any private tutoring at all or private English lessons? So I actually can't speak to this one as much because I have um, personally not actually done any tutoring so far. Um, I actually have been thinking about uh, picking up some <laughs> lessons. Mm -hmm. um, but just as far as like my personal situation, um, like as far as like my own personal schedule, so with lesson planning, and then uh like financially it hasn't been like i don't think it's been a big necessity for me personally mm -hmm. yeah um, it's I good to hear that not that everybody does it it's good to know that it's not 
you know, people do it, but it's not something that you absolutely have to do to get by, it sounds like. Right, exactly. So, like, in other words, if you choose not to or you don't have time or anything, you're not going to starve, you know. Um, now, that being said, I definitely think it is a helpful thing to do. And like I said, I've been thinking about picking it up, um, especially, you know, with, like, some of my bills going up with the abono and things like that. It can definitely help offset um, some bills that you might not foresee also, mm -hmm. such as going to the doctor, for example. Um, but no, I definitely do echo some of the things that Margaret has said. Um, it's, it shouldn't be too hard to find, um, some tutoring. Uh, if you, um, just ask your bilingual coordinator, maybe talk to some of your teachers or your students. Um, Facebook I know has also been a good tool. I, I've seen, uh, I'm part of a CIEE Auxiliaris group on Facebook, and I see um, Auxiliaris posting opportunities on there pretty frequently. Um, they usually will say, like, uh, you know, the number of kids, uh, what kind of family it is, where they live, things like that. Um, and generally, I also have seen people charging anywhere between 15 and uh, up to 20 euros an hour, even. Um, and I definitely know uh, one of my friends, actually, he tutors, I think, five lessons a week at this point. And so that's like a really nice chunk of money. And that's pretty much yeah. all his spending money and travel money. So um, <laughs> if you're into that, it's definitely a recommendable thing for sure. So Definitely. We get a lot of questions about it. So thank you both for that. For time's sake, we're going to continue on to savings. Um, and I'll have Margaret go first here. Before you left, how much did you save? Um, and what sort of cost would you recommend everyone thinks about pre-departure and upon arrival? Um, I had saved kind of, I think maybe at least three or 4,000 specifically for Spain, just because I knew um, I was gonna travel all summer. Uh, so yeah, that's one thing I would definitely say to think about before. Um, yeah, and then also, um, you don't get paid until a month after you arrive. So up front, there are kind of a lot of costs, um, with your, you know, your deposit for your apartment, first month's rent, um, figuring out phone, some people have to pay, you know, for internet, things like that. Um, so yeah, I would recommend kind of having a lot saved beforehand. Mm, thank you. And what about you, Alvin? Yeah, it's similar to Margaret, three to four thousand. Um, in terms of cost, I kind of budgeted from how, from what people have said on, in the Auxiliaris Facebook group. So with that in mind, I figured out how much I would need to save up for groceries, for the average rent, and then for the extra travel that I had already planned. All right, and John, what about you? Yeah, uh, definitely the same as Alvin and Margaret. I'd say mm -hmm. the magic number is at least 3,000, and that's how much I um, <clears throat> saved up more or less, I think. Um, and even then, there were, there were times where things got tight. So um, as, much as, as much as you can on the front end, uh, try to save because, um, yeah, you, you won't get paid, at least for my school, uh, you won't get paid until you have been teaching for a month. So for me, that was at the end of November. Mm -hmm. um, as well as um, near the beginning of the week, uh, my there, we were staying in the you know the hotel um, during the um, orientation. orientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I didn't think about it at the time, but me and some of my other uh, all our friends, we would be eating out a lot, right? Because we're spending the week in that hotel, right? And so we don't really have a means of cooking, and so mm -hmm. we would go eat, out to eat maybe once or twice a day. Um, and so that was actually kind of a uh, unforeseen um, expense uh, just to kind of keep in mind. So Yeah, it's definitely good to think about that. Um, there are obviously costs associated with the visa application process as well. Um, things like that. The, the visa application itself is um, to submit it. It's a $160 fee. So we always try to encourage people to remember that um, in your background check and the postil if you're um, joining the academic year program, you need all those documents authenticated. Um, that's not something we include in the program fee, so also something to think about. But yeah, really envisioning yourself getting started in a whole new country and city 
super important to have some savings for sure. So I don't know if we have any questions. Hillary's going to check. I don't think we do. Um, no, so we don't, we don't have any questions. Panelists, you can, <laughs> if we had any questions, I'd say feel free to, to chime in um, with your answers. But if we don't have any questions, that is the conclusion of our current and former participant webinar. Um, and anyone who is listening, oh, it looks like we might have one question. <laughs> Tristan, we, we are definitely waiting here. We're here for your questions. Um, but yeah, anyone who is listening, recorded or live, can email us at teachinspain at CIEE.org or give us a call. Um, it sounds like we do have one question coming in. Let's see. On the breaks, can you talk on the breaks that the schools go on? So I think that means vacation, like ho holidays. Um, so there, and current and former participants, please chime in. Um, yes, holidays, vacations, etc. cetera. Um, how, anyone wanna chime in with your experience so far or your past experience with your paid holidays and vacations as an auxiliar? Um, I, I could, say that there are the general vacations like winter break and spring break but then spring break would be the easter week long Santa. holiday mm -hmm. yeah but then there are also those random days, days. one day <laughs> yeah we, we we call it the puentes so it mm -hmm. could be either on the fridays or the mondays mm -hmm. so you could be lucky depending on on what days your school gets off where you get extra days off on the weekend um, but those are scattered throughout the whole year. With my community, the school that I'm placed in, our town has special holidays in of themselves. Mm -hmm. So because of that, there are some days throughout the year where our specific community has holidays where other schools don't. Mm -hmm. So I would check in with your coordinator so yeah. you can plan ahead on what you can do on those days that you don't have yeah, Comunidad de Madrid usually has a general calendar, but again, schools may have different um, different holidays depending different days. Um, we had one question about how many positions there were going to be in the Comunidad de Madrid this year. We have 650 um, for the academic year. And then we have one listener who's curious about training for the position and the learning process of actually becoming an assistant. Um, so that's going to, to end out at my current and former auxiliares panelists, you chime in as well, um, as to your individual training experience. It's going to differ from school to school, but what is our experience, um, Alvin or John, with the training that you got once you arrived to your school? Yeah, so uh, when I got to my school, I was introduced with the bilingual coordinator who is also the principal and PE teacher. And he showed me all the classes that I'll be in. He gave me my schedule. And with that, introduced me to all of the teachers who I will be working with. And as mentioned earlier, each teacher has their own way that they utilize the auxiliaris. So sometimes, the teachers will have you present or read in front of the students. Sometimes they'll have you chime in every now and then to make sure that they're pronouncing your word correctly. So there's nothing in terms of formal training that you would have to do to be preparing yourself for this position. It's fairly easy to dive in without any educational background, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I, from what I've heard from other participants, it's very different depending on the school and what they need you to help with. Um, but that's something that they would obviously go over with you upon arrival. Um, and we only have about two minutes left. We did just get a question about the third of Central Madrid placements being within the M30. Um, so that's, it's not something specific. We don't have a list of schools that is this, the same every year, first of all. Um, it depends on who's renewing at certain schools and um, what the school's needs are. But the Madrid is comparted of 21 different districts. And what we say when we say a third are in the city is that the, a third are in 
you know, within those 21 districts that make up the center. Um, but I liken it to like boroughs of Boston or New York. Um, you're, it's, you know, Somerville is a neighborhood within Boston, you know, that kind of thing. But it's not a fixed list of schools that we say this third is in the city and these two thirds are not. It's not a fixed list. Um, it, it's different every year depending on who stays and who renews and what the schools need. It's not specifically within the M30. It's whatever whatever the schools need. It's not the same every year. Um, but referring to that third that are central in the city refers to the um, districts. The, so, you know, being within the 21 districts as opposed to, um, you know, that area that is contained by the M30. Um, but that's all our time. Thank you to Alvin, John, and Margaret for joining us. We really, really, really appreciate you. Um, and if anyone who is still listening has any questions, like we said, please send us an email to teachinspain at cieee.org, or you can click the, or and we'll send this out so it'll be clickable. Um, you can schedule a call with us to talk while we're in the office. So thank you everybody and goodbye, John and Alvin. Um, I hope that everything continues to go well and thanks again for joining us. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, yeah. have a good night. Thanks, thanks guys. Thanks, bye guys. Adios.